that they were going to come home. He was like, stop that. It really wasn't him. And we were like, hang on. I might be with the All right. So we'll kind of pick up where we left off. Um, finish up the facade distribution, do a little bit with the uniform. Uh, we could set us up for review Wednesday, and then we have the in class exam this Friday. Yeah. So, just as kind of a reminder, all right, very similar to the binomial, we're using the Poisson distribution. We're trying to find the probability of a different number of success. So, the number of success we're looking for was X. We said lambda was just kind of this average number of successes we typically see, right? And so, that's going to have to be given to us. And we looked at a couple of problems. Um, one thing that we didn't look at was something like, what if I want to find the probability of seeing a certain number of successes or greater, right? So in this situation, we have a hospital. They have an average kind of birth rate they see over a given time interval, right, this hour. And they want to know what's the probability that they see two or more births this next hour, right? So we're always trying to predict the future, right? We've got this random variable we don't know the outcome of. So what we're really saying is, we want two or more, we want to know what's the probability X is greater than or equal to two. Okay. So here, we can identify what our lambda is. The average rate we typically see is 1.25. But we've now got this range of values we're looking for. So kind of similar to the binomial, we said, what could we do? We could look at every single outcome that would fit this criteria, take the probability of every single outcome, add them all up because we can only ever see exactly two births or exactly three, right? There's no kind of overlap. We said these are kind of like mutually exclusive outcomes. So here I start the probability X is equal to two. I add to that probability X is equal to three. I add to that probability X is equal to four. But when do I stop? Uh, yeah, I don't know, right? So with the binomial, we had this N, right? We said this was kind of what made, um, how we could identify the difference between using the binomial Poisson is that we were kind of capped in the number of successes you could see with the binomial. Here, it's kind of open-ended, right? How many births could we see over a given hour? You know, depends on the population of the city. You know, maybe we could put a cap, but here it's open-ended. And also, every single time we're finding a probability, what do we have to do? Use that probability mass function that we had here. I'm going to have to use that a significant number of times. If I'm asking you to do some exam, probably means there's an easier way to do this, right? So what's maybe an easier way I could find the probability X is greater than or equal to two here? Yeah. Yeah, so if we think about this is our event A, right? Well, if I know the probability I see two or more births, the probability that I see kind of less than two births would be it's complement. So we can subtract the event's complement from one, and that should give us the probability of the event we're interested in. We looked at this with a couple of binomial examples. The same sort of rule, right? The complement rule can apply here. Okay. Now from here, I got to be a little bit careful. What outcomes fit this criteria? Yeah, right. If I don't have that equality sign, because we're dealing with these discrete random variables, the first integer value I could see would be one success. Right? You can kind of think about what other outcomes would fit this criteria. We can't forget about having no successes. Right? But we can't see something happen a negative amount of time, so that's kind of where we stop. Right. So it's open ended if we kind of continue off into these larger numbers. But if we're looking at the lower end, right, we're always kind of censored at zero. That's the lowest number of, of successes we could see. And now from here, it's just we've got our Poisson distribution. Go back here. So we've got that lambda of 1.25. First x value we had was one. We'll plug those in and into our calculator, get that probability. We then do the same exact thing using that same lambda. Hasn't changed at all. Right? It's the same average rate that we typically see over that hour. But now we're looking for the probability of zero successes. So we plug zero in for X, which should make things quite a bit easier for us. Why? Plug zero factorial. One. Whoop. With anything raised to the zero power. One, right? 
So it simplifies, just like the binomial, it simplifies our probability mass function quite a bit when we're looking for zero successes. So we go ahead and plug those in, right? We can actually come up with what those values are. You know, if you want to go back, kind of try to reproduce these answers, make sure that you can get these things done into your calculator correctly. Once again, if you haven't found that factorial button on your calculator, Google it first, but if you can't find like Googling your specific calculator, come talk to me and I can kind of help you find that. Okay. Um, and then we can't forget, we have to subtract it from one because that was kind of how we set this up using that complement. Okay. Any questions on can, any of the, it's a little bit of almost a review. I'd say similar principles of what we're doing with the binomial. We're just using a different probability mass function now. It's actually a little bit easier, I think, than, than probably using that binomial. Okay with this? Any questions here for the moving? So um we talked a little bit about this with the binomial. I said sometimes I, I'll steal these things from the book if they if they're nice, right? And so what was a weird property we said about the Poisson distribution? So its mean was simply going to be the mean was equal to the we have the mean was equal to the variance, and they were both whatever that average rate was, right? So if we think about the mean being the most likely outcome, when we visually see this in a bar graph, that should have the highest bar, right? If we're kind of plotting that probability on our y-axis. So, you know, if we have a relatively low lambda, 0.1, what are gonna be the two most likely outcomes? Well, the discrete random variables, so we can only see integer values. But if the average is usually 0.1, more often than not, we're probably gonna see zero successes, or one success will be the next most likely. Now, with something like 0.1, notice those probabilities are significantly different, but they're still the two most likely outcomes. And it just kind of helps us think about what these distributions will look like, right? And then as we move in either direction, just like the binomial, if you move away from that mean, the probabilities fall. This is kind of an you know, easy way if we had worked through one problem, we said, you know, find the probability x is equal to three, and then we want to find the probability x is equal to four, we know at least in which direction that probability should, should go. Right? We know if it'd be higher or lower, and you know, allow us to catch a pretty easy mistake. And we then got to look at okay, what if the average rate starts to increase, right? Now instead of seeing 0.1, you want to think about a time interval like over an hour. What if I see 0.5? Well, zero and one are still the most likely outcomes, but notice they're a little bit less likely, 0.6 and 0.3, than they were before, right? Or at least kind of our distribution is shifting more to the right where these values that are kind of higher start to have probabilities that are a little bit further away from zero. And then as we continue to kind of move that mean over and kind of see it, we're really just shifting our distribution to the right. Now with the Poisson distribution, what looks like it's true about all of these, they would all have what skew? Right. A right skew, right? Now, the higher the mean gets, the less that right skew is going to look like. But you got to think about, when we talked about where does this end, <laughs> Right, that tail is going to go out for you know <laughs> forever, right? Infinite. So we're always going to probably see this kind of looking like this right right skew distribution. Just trying to relate this to other things we already talked about. We covered this in the last class. We jumped around a little bit, so we already kind of went through that. Um, we'll go through one more example. I'm in time. Okay, so here's this guy uh, Brewer for Guinness in 1899. All right, no formal training in statistics. Okay. Um, but as he's working at this brewery, he notices like, as I'm sampling these, these particles from this huge vat of liquid, right? So if you go to a brewery, like none of you are now 21, so maybe you have, but like you've got this huge, they have these huge vats like that are 40 feet high, right? So there's all this liquid. You might want a certain particles of these particles per milliliter to ensure that your beer is tasting the right way or, you know, it's whatever you want, okay? So he's sampling this and notice it's kind of following this nice Poisson distribution, right? As you sample more and more, he's building up all this data and kind of start to look at how these probabilities of seeing a different number of particles per milliliter has changed. Um, so this is kind of a foreshadowing of, of after the exam, but he discovers also a, kind of a distribution that we'll start kind of using after the, the um, first exam, which is a student T. Usually these distributions have a name associated with them because it's whoever came up with it. He didn't have any formal training. This is why he gets kind of this name student. All right, so that's kind of a little bit of foreshadowing, kind of where we're going after the exam, and then made a bunch of money, right? So I said that on the exam, and the 
um, on your connect homework assignments. I only gave you examples where you're looking at time intervals, and I will kind of just keep it at time, um, make it a little bit easier on us. But we can really do this over any interval, right? So we could do this over an, of a space. I think even I mentioned on Friday, you know, what if we saw the certain number of successes over a mile, right? It doesn't have to be time. I'm just going to keep it at time example. But here's one where you could think about it if it wasn't a time example. Okay. So we've got this volume of liquid, right? We've got a milliliter. That's kind of our space, right? It's no longer an hour. It's no longer a week. It's just this milliliter of liquid. Now, the number of the successes that we're looking for, the number of these particles in this over the space are in this milliliter of liquid. So he draws this out, he gets a sample, and he sees there's exactly 10 particles per milliliter, right? So that's the evidence that we have that over this interval of one milliliter, the average number of successes or the average number of particles we see is 10. Okay? So we're given kind of this average rate based off of the sample that we took. That we're going to see 10 of these particles in this liquid space. Okay. So if we then want to know what's the probability we see exactly eight, right? What do I do? All right. Well, I've already got my average rate. What's the only other thing I needed for that Poisson distribution? What's the whole point of that Poisson distribution? We're saying what's the probability that this random variable X is equal to a certain number of successes? So there, the only other thing that I need is what? Remember, this was kind of our general form. Let's see if I can remember talk of memory. So what are these, the only other thing that we need for this equation? X, right? Well, what is X? X is the number of successes we're interested in finding the probability of. So here, if I want to know what's the probability I see in this next, you know, in the entire liquid that I've got eight particles, right? there my x value would just be eight, right? And then we attack it just like we did the other problems, right? I've got I plug in eight everywhere I see x, I plug in ten everywhere I see lambda, and I can kind of get this probability. So um, just looking at these, I'm going to kind of make a broader point here. Which of these can you probably rule out? Actually, which one of these can you for sure rule out? So what would be the most likely outcome here? So with the binomial, we said if we think about the mean, that should be the expected value or the most likely number of successes we see. So here, if we're given this mean rate of 10, what's the most likely outcome I could sh should see? 10. If it's the most likely, right, and I think about this visually, so I've got 10 here, should have that highest bar, right? It should be the highest probability. So what has to be true if I go down to eight? Probability is gonna be a little bit lower. So based off of that, which of these can you for sure rule out? The can't technically rule out D. It's probably not very likely because it's pretty close to that expected number. So you're thinking the probability probably shouldn't be as low as 0 0.009. But what if the probability of eight is 0.8? Why can't that be the probability? This was 0.8. This would have to be something that's greater than 0.8. So you can even just make up some numbers to kind of prove this concept to yourself. Well, remember, if we add up the probability of every single possible outcome, what should those add up to? If I simply added up these two probabilities now, based off what I know about the direction that the probabilities will go in relationship to that most likely outcome, that mean value, these two would have to add up to something greater than one. So for sure, you could tell me that this probability has to be less than what value? What if it was 0.5? Even if this was just, you can prove it to yourself with just like the most incrementally larger number, now these add up to more than one. So for sure, you can at least bound your answer to you know make sure you didn't make a calculator mistake. You know that probability is going to have to be smaller than 0.5 if it's not the most likely outcome. 
right? Because if it's greater than 0.5, it would make it automatically the most likely outcome. So just kind of some of these principles that kind of allow you when you're working through these problems, especially when it comes to the exam, you know, you hit the wrong button on your calculator and you get an answer that's 0. 0.7. If you get too lost in the formula, right, that I'm just plugging things in, oh, 0. 0.7, whatever, that's that's got to be the answer. But if you take a step back and think about the problem you're working on, you know that that probability that you see eight successes can't be greater than 0. 0.5. So before you even start to plug things in, you can kind of think about the range of possible values you should see. Okay. Any questions on that? It's a little bit different way of thinking about it, I think, than I, I described it with a binomial, so. Okay with that. All right. So, um, you know, from there, it's just a matter of plugging these values in, right? For sine distribution. Um, again, finding that factorial. Even if you couldn't find the factorial, just to review, how would you enter that denominator into your calculator? Yeah, the easiest way to think about it, start with that number, multiply down to one, right? That's the easiest way to do it, okay? All right, so not any more questions on that. I'm gonna show you another type of thing we can do with the Poisson. It's not in the slot, so I'm gonna kind of go off, just do board work here. So any questions before we move on to the next example? Okay. So, how many of you have started to connect, or do I not want to know that? Okay, I've got everybody. All right. So, there's a, probably a couple of problems on there that you might have gotten stumped if you were trying to work on the Poisson distribution equations after what we did on Friday, seeing some people nod their heads, right? So, let's say um, that over a given year in the US, I don't know, 48 <laughs> people get struck by lightning, right? I think it's roughly that I looked it up and it was from, from what I could find, right? So one way you can think about, I'm just gonna write here a subscript is to think about whatever time interval I'm looking at, I'm just gonna write that up there so, so we know. So over a year, the average rate or the average number of people struck by lightning is 40. If I then ask you for, okay, what's the probability that exactly three people are struck by lightning this month? Okay. So we're changing the timer, right? But and it's a little bit of a stretch here. If we assume that whatever variable we're looking at has kind of a uniform distribution, which I want to talk about in a second, over kind of the entire year, then one thing we could do, if I know the average rate, the average number of people every year struck by lightning is 48, how would you maybe find the average number of people struck every month? Yeah, right? How many months are there? 12, right? So what you would do is you want to find now the average rate over your new time interval, okay? So you can kind of take your old lambda, right? Or the kind of longer time interval, and you're going to divide it by some factor, okay? So anytime you're going from larger to kind of like a smaller time interval, you can think about is you're going to take whatever the average rate was over that larger time interval, and you're going to divide it by some factor. Okay. Now, if I give you one like this on the exam, the ones in the homework, it's not going to be, I'm not going to have you convert yards to, you know, mile, yeah, nothing like that. It's going to be some, something simple, number of months in a year, number of days in a week, right? So if I gave you the average rate over a week, how would you then find the average, or sorry, a certain probability, a probability of certain number of successes over a day. You would just divide by seven, right? So I'll keep it these really kind of easy kind of examples where you should know the factor. I might even be annoying on the exam and tell you there's seven days in a week or something like that, right? Just to make sure that there's no confusion. But once I do this, right, what's my new, what's my new average rate? Well, 48 over 12. I've got my new lambda of four. Now it's just a matter of, I've got, that number of successes I'm interested in. So now instead of eight, right, we have three. And our average rate is no longer 10, but now in our example, we're looking at an average rate of four. So we can kind of take this original average rate that was given to us and convert it into the time interval we're interested in. Now, like I said, in practice, we have to be a little bit careful. You know, I assume that even based off my example, certain months, it's more likely to be struck by lightning than others. And so then, you know, we have a little bit of an issue there. But if we, if we assume that it's constant across the time interval, 
right? Then we could scale it something like this. Yeah. What if, um, I told you that there's five accidents on the Galliard every day. Right? That's kind of the average rate. So my time interval is, is over, over a day. I see five accidents. And I then want to find the probability over the next week that, I don't know, there's 25 accidents. Okay. So now I've got a smaller time interval. Okay, so I've got a smaller time interval. And I want to go to a larger time interval, right? So I need to find what's my average rate over the next week, okay? I guess I shouldn't have this as an equal sign. I was error there, right? So what would I do there? Yeah, now I'm just gonna take, and I'd multiply by what? Yeah, right, there's seven days in the week, or as a more general kind of term, you can kind of take the smaller average rate and then you are multiplying by some factor. So it might be an easy way just to think about it, right? Anytime I'm going from a larger to a smaller time interval, I should be dividing by some value, right? Making the number smaller. Anytime I want to go from a smaller to a larger time interval, I need to multiply by some factor, make that larger number or larger number, number larger, right? Okay, so those are kind of the two different um, examples that I could, could kind of give you. Where we're kind of either making that time interval longer or shorter. Um, so when you get to that exam, when you get to those Poisson distribution equations, read carefully what I'm asking for the probability, like what time interval I'm asking you for the probability of seeing a certain number of successes, because it may not have, you know, you may not have to do any conversion if I keep the time interval the same, but if I ask you for a shorter or a larger time interval, you might have to then kind of first compute that average rate for your new time interval. And then that's the lambda you use once you go to that Poisson distribution probability mass function. Any questions before we keep moving? Shouldn't be too bad. I think the one on that, um, I forget the example on the connect homework, but I know that there is a problem where they kind of have you change that rate. Okay. All right. So, and then another classic stats meme. Have you ever heard the joke about the Poisson distribution? It's pretty efficient. Ah. Does anybody get it? See, someone got it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Terrible stats jokes, but you know, a little brother. So we're gonna introduce this idea. I'll go through this pretty quick just for some general facts about the continuous distribution. Um, because we're really only gonna focus on the uniform distribution before we get to this first exam. After that exam, we'll start diving into you know the normal distribution, which we'll be using for a long period of time throughout the semester. Um, and allow us to do some pretty cool things once we get to some linear regression. So we think about a continuous random variable. Unlike the discrete random variable, it could take on all the integer values, but also any fraction of it. Okay. So we think about that probability density function. It's going to be a little bit different than what we're doing with a discrete random variable. Okay. We said discrete random variables usually have a pretty small, finite number of responses, right? This is the idea of the number of children in a household. Well, I know I'm going to see something between zero and 20, right? But if I think about a truly continuous random variable, let's say we'll treat income, right, as this truly continuous random variable. What are the number of possible responses I could actually see that variable take? Or thinking about interest rates. If I could see any decimal value, technically, how many outcomes are there I could see? Yeah, infinite. So if someone mouthed it, right? So even if, we recall, like when we were doing things with flipping a coin, if I flipped a coin, what was the probability came up heads? Well, there's two outcomes. So we said one over two. What if I roll a dice? Dice, right? Well, there's six outcomes, one over six. So even if we assume that every single outcome is equally as likely, if I've got an infinite number of responses, what's the probability of any one response? One over infinity, which anyone who likes math, what is this approach? Yeah, zero, right? And so we can't find the probability of one specific value here. In fact, if we want the probability of any one specific value, we actually think about that's equal to zero because there's an, technically an infinite number of possible responses. So all we can do is find the probability over intervals. Right? So we can't just look at one specific value, but we can find the probability over certain intervals. Um, we'll start looking at this um, 
I, I'll show you a couple of the probability mass functions, but the normal distribution. Uh, we will have some function that tells us kind of how, uh, well, I'll give you a visual here. Come back. All right. So maybe this is our probability mass function. We kind of graph this out. It's an actual functional form. So we get this nice line, right? So I'm kind of going to calculate set each other. If I want the probability that I'm in between any two values, well, I've got the function for this line. I can kind of integrate the area under this curve between two values. I'm not going to make you do integration, so don't, don't worry, right? We're not going to do anything too crazy there. But that's the idea behind what we'll start doing, right? We'll have this nice functional form, and we can find the probability under that curve in between two points. Okay? So this might be like for income, what's the probability that I see the average income be between 40 and 50,000? Right? Or that if I select a person at random, that their income is in between 100 and 125,000, things like that. Now, all the same kind of rules will, similar rules will apply, like we talked about for discrete random variables, which is, um, if I take the probability, or if I look over the, the entire outcome space, right, every single possible outcome, and I add those probabilities up, those probabilities should all add up to one. But with this nice continuous distribution, what that's really saying is, if I start from the lowest possible value and go to the highest possible value, when I integrate over that entire space, right, the entire area under the curve should always be one. So that's kind of, you know, before we were looking at Venn diagrams, thinking about the entire experimental outcome space of one. Now our, when you think about our experimental outcome space is like this area under the curve. Okay. So any, uh, the probability over any given interval at the very lowest could be what? What if I ask you what's the probability somebody makes between zero and negative, or negative 5,000, negative $10,000? Mm -hmm. Probably zero, right? So we know that the lowest it could be at zero, but then likely, right, over some variable space, even if it's close to zero, will be greater. Um, and then we talked about you know, integrating over the entire space, right? All of the x values, you should kind of get to the value of one or the area under the curve being equal to one. I'll kind of punt on the kind of no sudden jumps here until we kind of after the exam, we start talking about the continuous or a uh, normal distribution. Um, this, this should be kind of what we need moving forward. So I can look here. Um, here and the curve is one. And really all we want to focus on kind of introducing the idea of a continuous random variable before this first exam is going to be the uniform distribution. So a uniform distribution means that every single outcome is equally as likely. So we're going to start out um, you know, thinking about if income was a continuous random variable, which it's likely not. But if it was, we would say the probability of seeing someone make between 10 and $20,000 so a $10,000 interval there, that would have to be the same as the probability somebody makes between 80 and 90,000, right? Same size interval, the probability should be the same. Now, income isn't a very good example of that, right? Because we probably know it's not uniformly distributed, but if it was, right, that would be the idea. So I think I have a, a visual of thinking about this that'll help, but this is gonna be our probability mass function, which is that if we're looking, uh, in between our minimum and our maximum value. So if you want to rewrite this, you can think about D as being the maximum value you can see this uniform and distributed variable take on, and C would be the minimum value. So we'll give you an easy way to think about this. So if I had all these different possible outcomes for X, and I know that this random variable X has to be somewhere between zero and 10, right? So maybe this is the, you know, the length of time you wait for something. If I were to break this up into 10 equally sized intervals, all of space one, right? Excuse me. There would be 10 of these intervals that were a width of width one, right? So even though this is a continuous random variable, we could break this down into 0.1 segments. But if I think about it as like these intervals of length one, right? What would be the probability of any one of these Intervals, right? So what's the probability I see this take on a value between one and two? What's the probability I see this take on a value between seven and eight? The same, but if I'm just between zero and 10, and there's 10 of these, each one should have a probability of 0.1 or 110, right? Now I can break these up, like I said, into much smaller intervals, but if I think of them as intervals that are of length one, 
it's you kind of start to envision, well, really all I'm doing there is taking one over how many of these intervals of length one there is. Now I use zero and 10 because it's easy to start thinking about from zero. But when we're finding this probability density function, notice it's not one over my maximum value. Right? It's not just one over 10. Because if I change my maximum and my minimum values, but I kept that interval, right? Same, going from 10 to 20. Well, now how many intervals of width one are there? Still 10. So each one would have a probability of one tenth, but I wouldn't divide by my maximum, right? What I'm really thinking about is if I could break this up into intervals of width one, how many intervals would be in my space? Well, whatever the difference is between my maximum and my minimum. So maybe that might help give somewhat of a, a I guess, some intuition behind why when we calculate the, the density function here, it's going to be one over whatever this range is, right? Yeah. On the test, do we have, oh, well, it's in the next year, so. <clears throat> Some of it, though. I remember I said there's going to be a couple of like, things. Like, right, what is the decimal? Like, say we get one-tenth. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can write, yeah, you could write point one or one-tenth. Either one is fine. Yep. I mean, if, on, if it was a multiple choice question, I will either display it to you as, I'll probably be displaying it to you as a decimal, right? So it's not like you're gonna see the options of one tenth, two thirds, that those won't be. I'd actually give you whatever the decimal, these would be the answers that you would see, right? But you'll have a calculator, so it should be, you know, should be okay. All right. Um, what else do I want to say here? So we've got the maximum. About, oh, and this is just kind of for completeness, right? If I know that this variable can only take on values in between 10 and 20, well, then what's the probability? I see it somewhere between 30 and 40. Well, if I know that it can't be outside this range, the probability of any other values outside this range has to be zero. Okay. So that's just kind of for completeness there. So I kept it kind of easy here where I had these intervals of length one. So I could almost think about it if I wanted to graph this out, all these intervals of length one have the exact same probability of occurring. Okay. So what if I want an interval that's longer than length one? Well, now it's it's not as easy, right? So let's say I want to know the probability that it's somewhere in between 10 and 20, or sorry, 10 and 20, 10 and 12. Well, I've got two intervals of length one there. I know that each one would have a probability of one over 10 or 0.1. So what's the probability I see it be between 10 and 12? 0.2, right? I've got two intervals of space one. But another way that you can think about that as, well, if I was to break up this interval 10 into segments that were all of width two, how many of them would fit in that? Five. So each one would have a probability of five intervals, all the same length, each one would have a probability of one-fifth of a current. Well, really what I'm doing there is saying, what's the kind of width of my interval, right? So I was keeping it easy here, being these intervals of one and then just doubling it. So now I have this interval, interval of two. But then the height of our kind of uniform distribution, we had being one over that maximum minus the minimum and one over D minus C. So what am I really doing if I have this truly uniform distribution? I'm just finding the area of a rectangle. What's the height of that rectangle? What's the width of that rectangle? Just wherever my interval starts and stops, we can call that A and B. So if I take that difference in A and B, that should be the width of my interval. I'm the area of a rectangle, take the width times height or length times width, whatever you want to call it there, right? And this simplifies down to, I have multiplying by one over D minus C would be the same as dividing by, okay? So trying to get a little insight, so just showing it to you and telling you this was what it is. Um, I think an easier way to think about the uniform distribution is to draw out what that uniform distribution is going to look like. And then visually think about, all I'm really doing is finding the area of a rectangle. I've got to figure out the height of that rectangle, but that's always just going to be one over, and what would this represent? If this is my maximum minus the minimum, 
this represents another statistic we talked about a long time ago. So it wasn't very useful for us at the time. The range, right? Which is why we said the variance is usually a much better measure of variation. But here, if we look at the range of possible values, one over that range will always be the height of our uniform distribution. Okay. Right? So let's put some actual numbers to this. We kind of think about visually here. Um, well, I'll skip this for a second because I want to get to an actual actual value or actual values here. So let's say we've got this goofy example where you guys haven't seen this movie. This is a great old movie with, with Hulk Hogan. Um, but let's say they're going to come out with Mr. Nanny too, right? Uh, also, he has some, some, some amazing old movies. Like, if you ever want to go down, like, uh, I mean, they're '80s, like, terrible movies, but they're they're so terrible. They're they're good. Um, anyways, so let's say the movie theater is trying to predict what their popcorn demand is going to be when they show this movie, right? And they know it's somewhere in between one and ten. So the way that we'll kind of notate these random variables, kind of say this random variable x is uniformly distributed. So we'll kind of use this u, and then what? two traits define our uniform distribution. Well, where does it start and where does it stop? Right? So here we've got kind of our minimum value is one, excuse me, and our maximum value is 10. Okay. So when I said to draw out this visual to kind of help you kind of with these problems, you kind of think about it as, I've got all these different possible values I could see for X, but I'm now told that this continuous random variable has to be somewhere in between one in 10. Okay. So I know I can only see values here. If they're all equally as likely, when we're thinking about those intervals of, of space one, what that really gives us is almost like this kind of, it's not a curve, right? Our, our function that I was showing you before, right? Where we had uh, something that looked like, go back there, right? This looks a little bit more interesting. This looks like a fun actual function, but we still have a function with our uniform distribution. It's just it happens to be this horizontal straight line, okay? Which makes our life actually quite a bit easier. I think once we get with the deal with the normal distribution, we'll kind of see that. Um, let's get forward here, back to our example. There we go. I already told you the answer, but we'll kind of talk through it, right? So I've got my minimum and my maximum value, right? If I want to know what's the probability, or sorry, what's the mean of this, I think an easy way to think of it's uh, similar to the binomial. I think the mean is kind of intuitive, right? So here, if everything's equally as likely, well, remember, what did we say when we were calculating the mean versus the weighted mean? The weighted mean treated every value a little bit differently depending on how many observations it represented, right? That grouped data. Well, now if everything's equally as likely again, it's almost like we're just looking for that in the middle value, right? Everything's weighted equally. We should kind of have equal values on either side of the mean. So this is a nice symmetric distribution. We said when a, a distribution is symmetric, the mean is the same as the median, right? We had no skew, right? So here we're really just looking for the middle value, right? So if I start at one and go to 10, what's my middle value? Let's add those numbers up and divide by two, right? It can kind of help me think about my distribution a little bit more. The mean there, I think, is fairly intuitive. Okay. But if we want the actual equation, what were we doing here? Well, I was taking the maximum and the minimum value and dividing by two. Mm -hmm. So we're just looking for that. Visually, we're just looking for the middle part of this distribution. We know where it starts. We know where it stops. We're trying to get the value that exactly splits in half, right? 50% above that value, 50% below. So here, this is an easy one. You don't even have to do any work. If I asked you for the probability that the amount of popcorn demand here was greater than 5.5, what should that be? This is the mean. I'm telling you it's symmetric. So the mean is equal to the median. The probability of seeing it be above five and a half would be, would be what? So if I'm looking for a probability, why can't it be five and a half? Has to be between zero and one. So right away, don't get too. Like, think about what we're trying to do first, and then we can even limit it where we know these these values have to be. So we know it's somewhere between zero and one. If this is the median, we said the median exactly split the data in half. Yeah. So now I've seen out right. This is going to be 
When we have a symmetric distribution, it should exactly split that distribution in half, 50% above, 50% below. So this sometimes can help me because then if I'm asked a question like, go forward here, and maybe I'm looking for the probability of being in between two values. Well, I'll have one here like, let's assume the, the theater wants to know, well, what's the probability I see above nine and a half pounds of popcorn demanded? And there's some excellent B footage from, from the movie. If you, if you want to look up more, there's, there's better skills than that. But So what I'm saying now is, what's the probability I see demand be nine and a half or anything greater? Right? So if I make nine and a half, what's the probability that demand was higher than that? So really what I'm looking for visually is this area here. Well, automatically, which of these can I rule out? So these aren't probabilities, these are in percentages. Can I rule any of those answers out right away? Yeah. Visually, if this space is 0.5, this space should be quite a bit smaller than 0.5, right? So just plotting that mean and thinking about there's 50% either side, once again, we can start to limit at least what we know these values should be, right? From here, it's just a matter of, well, all right, where does my distribution, or sorry, no, where's my distribution? Where does my interval I'm interested in start and stop? We kind of call those values A and B, right? Or we can think about, and you know, we have A and B. We also have our maximum, which we said was notated as D, minimum as C, plug them into that probability density function, or, what I think is easier is draw out my visual. I now have the area of a rectangle. What should the height of this rectangle be? We said this is always just one over B minus C or maximum minus minimum or our range. So in this situation, it would be one over 10 minus one, right? My maximum is 10, my minimum is one. So I've now got the height of my rectangle. What's the width here? These numbers are pretty easy to see. Well, if it goes from nine and a half to 10, and I think about really what you're doing in your head there is you're just taking the difference between the two. I've now got this height of one ninth. I've now got the width, which is one half. And that kind of gives me the entire area of that rectangle or the area under the curve. It's not a curve now, it's a straight line, but it's still our, our, our uh, probably mass function. So it's underneath our curve in between these two values. Okay. Any questions on, on just that process? What if I wanted the probability demand was in between two and two and a half pounds here? Should be the exact same thing. Why? Equal length interval, right? I'm looking at an interval of length 0.5 for the uniform distribution, every interval of the same length should be have the exact same probability. So if I find the probability of one interval that's a length of 0.5, I automatically know the probability of every other interval that's a length of 0.5 within that maximum minimum value. So I think that should be what, 5.6%? We enter that into our calculator here. Or nine figures. So we got a little bit. So here's kind of, you, you know, you could plug those values in that probability density function. If you don't want to think about it, kind of get this visual and the area of a rectangle, then by all means, you'll have this function on your formula sheet. You can, you know, think about D and C or your maximum minimum value of the uniform distributed variable, D and A, maximum minimum of the interval you're interested in, right? You can just plug everything in. But like I said, I just think it makes sense to draw the distribution out, kind of prevents us from making easy mistakes and just see, I don't know. It's always better to have a visual visual aid, at least for what I think, or at least in my opinion. I say. Um, okay, so this one's going to go back to something I already said, but I'll prove it to you at least with this specific continuous random variable. I said for the continuous random variable earlier, we're finding the probability over these intervals, right? So what if I had the same setup and I said, what's the probability that they make nine and a half and demand is exactly nine and a half? The probability of that one specific value should be, shouldn't even have to work this one out. How many values are there technically in between one and 10? I'm looking at a continuous random variable. 
I can go out to any decimal, infinite. So we said the probability of any one value would be zero. Automatically, I should know there should be zero. But I can prove this to myself. Okay. So let's say we have this uniform distribution. I'm just drawing it out again. Goes from one to 10, right? Kind of this nice uniform distribution. If I want the probability of exactly nine and a half, where's my rectangle visually? That's a straight line, right? It starts and it stops at the same value. So then when I'm thinking about that density function that gives me the probability of an interval, what is this numerator? If I'm starting and stopping at the same value, doesn't matter what the range is of my uniformly distributed variable, that numerator would always be, yeah, zero. Right? So here, even if I solve this, well, even if I plug in my values, right? If my interval starts and stops and at the same exact value, that density function will tell me the probability is zero that one specific value, right? The only time I start to see positive values is if I'm starting to look over an interval, right? You know, so I could make this really small. Maybe I do like 9.49 and 9.51. I can't find the probability of exactly nine and a half, but I can find the probability of a pretty small interval, pretty tight interval there, but I can't find the probability of any one specific value with a truly continuous random variable, okay? Any questions on this before we keep going here? Okay, Lewis, right now. All right, so I think I can have you kind of plug those values in, prove yourself that it's zero. I had some other stuff uh, that's not as relevant and kind of fun. Um, five minutes. I'll try to go through one of it. It's kind of interesting. We'll kind of try to relate the binomial and the Poisson distribution, I guess, in a way it's almost like starting some review where we're already starting to work backwards kind of towards the binomial. And then uh, before I forget, in the class here on Wednesday, instead of using the eye clickers today, I put up an online quiz. So that should pop up on Canvas. I think I had it set to release as soon as, well, I think 10 minutes after we're done with class, it's set to release. But it's basically just a survey. So um, it, it just, Get on and submit your answers. You'll get the 10 out of 10. And it's basically going to help me organize one of these Wednesday's class period to ask you like what topics you have difficulty with, um, just some different kind of setups of what the exam review could look like. Do you want some more time to work on stuff on your own and then come to me with questions or would you like to see me work through more problems? Some kind of combinations of those things. So you'll see that pop up, pop up on Canvas. If you could, unlike usual, not before we start class on Wednesdays at do, but submit it sometime before midnight tonight because I kind of need to be able to look at your responses in, it in order to then make adjustments to what we're going to do Wednesday, okay? So if you can get on this afternoon or sometime this evening, make sure you submit that. Um, it'll kind of help us organize Wednesday a little bit better, okay? So something interesting that we can think about, and I didn't really make this point yet with the Poisson, but, but here I'll kind of um, give you a, a way to think about this. So let's say that we've got some 10,000 atoms, right? And they're radioactive, okay? So the probability that any one atom decays over some one minute time period is 0. 0.0005. And the problem, what if we wanted to find the probability exactly three atoms decay this minute? Now, this shouldn't be too bad in the sense of if we're thinking about success failures, right? And I, I know that the atom decaying is my success, the failures it's not. So I've got my binomial set up. That's a one zero response there. I know that the number of possible atoms I could see decay is capped at 10,000. It's a big number, but it is capped. Right? And that the probability that any one atom decays is this 0 0.005. So I have a nice binomial setup here. But if I plug these in, I mean, 10,000 factorial, I kind of asked you to do 100 factorial and your calculator's freaked out, right? And we now, what's one thing here? It actually wouldn't matter. How could I solve this one without having to use that factorial button? Because you can take out the nine hundred nine thousand nine hundred ninety-seven. Yeah. So right, we kind of said if you just if your calculator freaks out, you could write something like this out and see that everything past nine hundred nine hundred sorry nine thousand nine hundred ninety-seven would cancel. 
So you'd have what, 10,000 times 9,999 times 9,998 divided by three times two. So we could probably get that entered into our calculator, right? But if these numbers were a little bit larger, or maybe instead of three atoms, maybe I have like, what's the probability 20 of them decay? Well, then even multiplying 10,000 down to what, 9,980 still might be a, a number that's a little bit too large, depending on what type of calculator we have, right? So there's actually another way that we can find this probability. So what we could do, right, if we have a really small probability of success and a really high number of trials, is compute the mean of that binomial distribution. We said this was kind of this intuitive, take the number of trials times the probability of success. We'll use that mean for our Poisson distribution. And now, right, so we kind of show, you know, once again, we can Google these proofs if they're not that interesting, but they allow us to see that it's a really good approximation where we could use that binomial kind of mean as our Poisson's mean, right? Now it becomes, well, I've got this new mean of five, sorry, mean of five for lambda, I want to find the probability that X is exactly equal to three. And if I enter this into my calculator, three factorial is a little bit easier to deal with. I can kind of see that I get out to the fifth decimal the exact same answer. So I'm not going to make you guys do anything like that in the exam. Just kind of another thing you kind of could kind of bring in, kind of talk about the binomial a little bit, kind of leading us into that exam review Wednesday. So I'm going to let you guys get out of here. Any questions for me before you get out of here? I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of the exam on Wednesday as well um, and bring questions. If you've looked through those practice exams, Wednesday's class is not for me, it's for you. So if you ask questions, that's it's going to be a lot more helpful, okay? All right, we'll see you guys on Wednesday.